Dobre Utra? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Um, that's all I got. Um, the seven archetypes of a DevOps transformation. Um, free drink for anybody can tell me why I have that backdrop there. Just saying. Um, have a little fun. So I, was, um, I did a keynote, Alibaba's first cloud conference in Hangzhou, China. And for some reason, I was making this like crazy, I do this, so anybody wants to take a shot now, like here it is. Because some of my good, good friends in my community decided to meme me. And here's the thing, like you can write books, you can speak around the world, but you ain't nothing until you've been memed. That's, when you, that's the big time. So they didn't let up. They kept going, and then they caught me with another pose, and then here I am, and then, of course, I am old enough to be there, but I actually wasn't there. It was Muhammad Ali. A little bit of my background, won't spend much time here. Um, John Willis, um, the best place to get a hold of me is Bachigloop. I do like to dialogue with people, but I do not speak Russian. That was the only word I knew, or two words I knew, so. Um, but Bachigloop, Twitter, Gmail, it's my GitHub project, nothing really exciting there, except all my presentations for the last seven years are in, um, everything else is forked projects, so. Um, the uh, botch glue, my presentation, so I'll have this one up there probably tomorrow, but. Um, quickly, um, this is really the last 10 years. I have literally almost 20, 30 years before that. I've been in this industry almost 40 years. Always de de transformation. I've been, you know, I geek in on some technologies and I hop out and do kind of transformation or what I would call meta skills. Uh, but I got invited um, to when Canonical was doing their first, like it was actually the second private cloud, it was pre-OpenStack. And so I got to work on that project. And then I was um, the ninth person in it, Chef, helped really kind of launch the, um, the technical non-development side of that business. Pretty proud to do that, in fact. They, uh, the founder gave me a credit card, Adam Jacob, and said, go DevOps. <laughs> and I just traveled around the world and, um, and did DevOps. I, um, I was with another company, did cloud management, uh, multi-cloud management, got lucky, sold it. So I, I've done like 10 startups in my career. I, I had one when I was like 21 years old, made a ton of money, wasted it all in the next three years, and then spent the next 30 years with failed startups until that one, and then I sold that to Dell. And then um, I got really lucky with another startup called Socket Plane. Nobody's ever heard of it because it was three months old. I sold that to Docker. Um, so life has been pretty good in the last five years. I now work for uh, SJ Technologies. On the right-hand side, I've been involved in the DevOps movement pretty much um, from the start. So, um, Written 10 books. The DevOps Handbook is one of them. Um, although I'm pretty proud of this one. I did this one about a year ago with Gene Kim, the author of the Phoenix Project. It's an audio only book. Um, it's really geeky. It's like 10 hours of just ridiculous geek. If you like things like Lean or, or Peter Senge or um, um, basically human factors and resilience, like that's your book. If you don't like that stuff, stay away from it. Um, and then I am actually about 30% done with a book that will be done at the end of next year, hopefully, uh, called The DevSecOps Handbook with Shannon Leach, James Wicket, Ernest Mueller. So, pretty low tech, huh? Looks pretty damn ugly, right? That, I think one of the things I've learned, um, I'm gonna talk about these seven archetypes. Well, in the last year, I left Docker about a year ago and I started going back to big companies and meeting CIOs and executives. And they would ask me this question is, John, I, either A, I don't understand what this DevOps thing is and everybody who explains it to me seems to have a different version, or, They've been tried to do it and they thought they were doing it the right way because they saw somebody present and said, these are the things you have to do to do DevOps, and it's not working. And these are old, 100-year-old companies, big financial. And so what I found actually over dealing with this is low tech is like the best technology. Because, and I'll get into this a little more deeper, but I found that literally I just want to talk to different teams. I spend weeks just talking to development teams, infrastructure, operations, security teams. And this is my last project. I just finished this like a week ago. And this was after the third day. And the fourth day, me and the partner I was working with just put up all these flip charts on the wall to do pattern matching and aggregation and summaries. 
And I will tell you, this is probably the the format I'm going to stick with from here on in. So, there you go. I think I got this one right too, but I cheated Google Translate. So, um, so what is DevOps? And you ask ten people, you're going to get ten different answers. But here's the kicker: they're all correct. There's no wrong answer. So, um, but my, the way I look at DevOps is, you know, I've been in this thing pretty solid for 10 years. I was the, I was the only American in the first DevOps day. I've been just, I probably, I won't say I'm not the smartest DevOps person, but I would challenge anybody to say that they've studied this movement harder than I have as a student. And I would say it's where human capital meets technology. Uh, we tend to forget the human side of things. We'll say culture this, culture that, but... It's about working and understanding humans. And we have data now. We've got like five years. We've got empirical. We've got academically solid data. And then there's just industrialized evidence that if you put certain behavior patterns together in an organization, organizational culture, that you will be, and, and this is the last uh, survey done by Dora, um, 2,000 plus times faster than somebody who doesn't focus on those behavior patterns. And here's the real kicker. You'll actually not only be 2,000 times faster, but you'll be 2,000 times more resilient. And to me, that's the nirvana of DevOps. You get the behavior correct. So you're a company X and you have these certain behavioral patterns. If you want to talk about them, I only got now 43 minutes left. <laughs> um, the, uh, we can talk about them in the thing. Um, there's a kind of really standard way to think. Look at this. If you have those behavior patterns and you're competing against somebody who doesn't, um, if you then apply these kind of patterns that we have, you'll in generally be 2,000 f- times faster and 2,000 times more resilient. Pretty good deal. So I, about two years ago, I was forced to actually talk to a CEO of a Fortune 5,000 company to explain DevOps. And then I freaked out because I was like, you know what? Imposter syndrome, you know, like, I, I like, how am I going to, like, in five minutes? And this is where I came up with this. So to me, this is my best way to say DevOps is a set of practices and patterns that turn human capital, organization, people, into high-performance organizational capital. Um, if you want a, an example of this, it's Toyota for, like, 50 or 60 years. Again, we can talk about that over there. That's me and my son. Uh, That's a 4,000 glass drop in the Grand Canyon. It's pretty freaky. Um, So one of the things that is used very heavily and has been used by most of the companies that have done pretty well trying to transform themselves through this DevOps name is something called Lean Value Stream Mapping. And there's a couple of really good books on it. Um, Karen Martin is probably the best one right now. Uh, She won a Shingo Award. Um, But here's the thing, right? The thing I've learned in the last year, this is even too high tech. So people come to me and they say, John, let me show you my value stream map. And and some of them have timing slices. It's all modeled after, um, you know, uh, automobile manufacturing. So knowledge work kind of translated. And, and, And it's cool. And I've used this a lot in my career. It's an amazing tool. But when the CIO asked me to come in and help him understand, him or her understand why their organization is not transforming, I realized this is way too far down the line. There are a bunch of fundamental questions and things I have to find out before I even get to that. And I think the mistake that all my, a lot of my peers make is we come in and say, DevOps is these five things, do them, I'll come back in six months and check on you. Or they come in and try even to use something that is reasonably low tech, like a soft skill tech, like value stream mapping, but again, that's going to miss, it's going to create what we call blind spots. So, so this is where I started thinking about one of the patterns that I keep seeing when I interview hundreds and hundreds of people through this CIO kind of come in. And I, I, I started looking to this to use this as my kind of pattern matching to put things into buckets. And I'll go through each of these, um, you know, um, the uh, work visibility, work management systems, tribal versus institutional knowledge, adversarial relationships, misaligned incentives, organizational orientation, and then what I call security and compliance theater. And if that doesn't translate well, it means that 
you're fooling yourself. You're doing a whole bunch of things you think are protecting your company, but you really aren't. Um, and so the, these are the things I look for beyond any tech, and that's why I wind up with a whole bunch of flip charts on a wall. Uh, the last one we did was a two-week engagement with a mutual fund company. I probably had 100, 150 of these flip charts. So the thing is, you can't lean, agile, safe, or DevOps your way around a bad organizational culture. Those are two, you're, you're, you're scuba diving without a mask, you're, uh, you're um, doing surgery with an x-ray, I don't know what metaphor I can use. If you don't know those kind of archetypes in the culture of that organization. So I, I, this is a mashup of two, uh, Dr. Deming and Drucker, uh, they both have really interesting quotes. I put them together. I say, bad culture eats good systems for breakfast. Uh, so if you know, uh, hey, someone clapper out there. Yeah, so you know the Drucker quote and then the Deming quote is like, that's it. Thank you. Um, so we're done. The archetypes, these are the solutions. I'll see you tomorrow. No, but, but like it is make all work visible. And I don't mean like visible in the sense that it has to show up on the screen. I mean visible as in you can see it somewhere. Um, consolidate your work management systems. Again, I'll go through these. Um, the, you know, the, the thing about tribal knowledge versus um, institutional knowledge, nine out of ten times it is there are bottlenecks that are people. It, you know, you go to an organization, you just, it's almost to the T, in a large organization, I'll find four people. The, the Phoenix Project, the novel, who's read that book? Yeah, right? There's a character called Brent. So if you get a chance to read that book, you'll understand this whole thing, that this project, and I'll talk about this a little later, um, that was really just a person. And he didn't understand that they were three years late on a project because of this one person. And I find those Brents everywhere I go. And so I use something called theory constraints, uh, collaboration hacks. I won't have time to get into Toyota Kata, which is an incredible. If you go to that thing on my GitHub, one of my projects, I have a presentation on almost every one of these subjects. So I have a whole presentation about what, how, what Kata means for us in our industry. And I'll talk about um, the last two, market-oriented and shift-left auditors. Um, so what I do is organizational fact-finding. I literally go ahead and... Um, and go into a company and just talk low tech. I mean, here's the thing, and I'll show you the technique I use. I call it graphical storytelling, but I literally, usually I have whiteboards. If I'm really lucky, I have smart, white, smart boards. But the last time they had none of that, so I had to use flip charts. And I'm like, actually, this might be better than smart boards. Because what I do is I get the teams in a room, and I start using those archetypes to tease out answers to find out where you are on a spectrum. And then I give them the marker and tell them to graphically tell me what they're telling me verbally. Because one of the things we do in meetings is we usually have one person writing notes. So we'll have like a two hour meeting about incredible stuff and we have this one person who's trying to capture it all and then what do you get the next day? An email of their summary. And it captures best, if they're amazing, maybe 10% of the conversation. So with the graphical stuff is every meeting I go to, I get on a board with markers. And it, I raise that bar to maybe 40% captured. So that's what I do, very low tech. And I, I try to build this around something called the William Schneider um, Reengineering Alternatives. Again, I, I could, this could last three hours if I didn't, weren't careful. But um, it's a quadrant of how you look at uh, Pedro Kahani at Facebook, the guy who invented SRE at Facebook. Um, Actually, I learned about this from him. He used it for hiring. But you can look at an organization based on these four quadrants. And what I do now at a high level, like the last summary slide I create out of all those hundreds of things is this. And I try to see, look at, like for example, if you're a high control, a command and control organization, which typically we say in DevOps is, it, is kind of an anti-pattern. But, but your competence is terrible. Like we got a lot of work to do here. Right, like you are a command and control, you got everybody buttoned down, they all have to listen and do it this way, but you still stink at what you do. As opposed to a company that has a high level of control, but is, uh, there's an equilibrium of the balance of the control and competence. You may be, hey, you don't need me. Maybe you shouldn't DevOps, 
right? Like that's, and, and you're making money, the business is fine. <laughs> you know, do you really need anybody's help right now? Um, and then, you know, this is the last one I did, which is kind of cool. High control, low competence, low collaboration, but these are the best kind of companies to work with because they had high cultivation. There was a lot of people there that was, they liked working there, there was low turnover, but the technical and organizational culture of how they did things sucked. So everybody liked everybody. They liked being there. They felt purposeful for why they were there, but they just stunk at collaboration and they were very, not very competent. Um, you know, so one of the things I do in this graphical storytelling is this idea of we get people, it was based originally off of uh, value stream mapping, but I find that any of the uh, prescriptive methods get in the way of finding truth. So I don't use any prescription. I, value stream mapping says you should always go right to left, you know, customer going back to creation, bullshit. <laughs> I, like, if people have a marker in their hand and they're writing stuff on the wall and telling me the absolute truth, because this is what the CIOs never get to hear. I don't want to stop it. Oh, stop right there. You're not doing it right, or you didn't create the box correctly. Like, I just let it go. And you can see some awful handwriting here in a minute. Um, some of it mine, some of it others. But the one thing I do try to describe is something Damon Edwards, uh, my co-host of Dove's Cafe podcast, has this idea of putting a multi-layer abstraction on it very simple, low tech, a black marker, a red marker, and a blue marker. And the black marker is just truth. This works this way. Well, no, no, no. There's three things in between these two things. Somebody else raises their hand and says, it really doesn't work that way. So you're just kind of building this truth. And then the red pen is like, how would you fix it? Not me. This is the other key. I'm not, when I go back to CIO, I'm not telling him or her anything that the people that work for him or her told me. I'm not saying do these 10 things. Now, ultimately, I want to connect the dots between the things they told me and the things that we know are good patterns. But I can't do that unless I get the truth. And then the blue pen is, how would they fix it? Um, and so this is an example of one I've done um, earlier this year at a bank. This was actually a security one where we had um, the security people in a room, and it was just them. And there was two, you see the black pen, and then you know, it started out with this. I have a, a woman that works with me that's amazing at turning that kind of stuff into good graphics. And we put it back on a smart board. And, and so one of the stories were that um, the security people um, were not invited. In fact, they felt they weren't allowed to go to design and requirement reviews for issues. I'm like, why? They have sec ops. Have you not heard? And, um, and they were like, well, we just... You know, we don't think we're supposed to go. And then when we brought in the other teams, we brought in, um, you know, at this point now, everybody here. This was a party, right? We had release engineering, we had cyber, we had IT risk. We had um, the DevOps team, if you will. Um, and, and then we actually found out what the real truth was, which it was an old institutionalized, you know, maybe eight years ago, um, the engineers of the software kicked the security people out because they were slowing them down. And that had turned into, over the years, this, you're not allowed to come, don't ask. But it wasn't really true. They just didn't ever ask. Um, so we took that, and here's the thing, like, so you can see we had four people, and then we had like about 15 or 20 people, and, and this, was, this happened to be a smart board, it, like, this story just kept going in like all sorts of directions. Um, it took almost three hours to get them to tell me what happened between code and build. So imagine that, right? Like, you think that should be the easiest thing. Most DevOps consultants go in and just assume that's already known. Oh, let's put Atlassian in, we're done. Right, nothing in Atlassian, it could be any suite of products. But here it was three hours with, their fi with five teams that I could even get to the discussion of really, really what happened between code and build. And, and then it, at some point, when they started joining the IT, the IT governance guy was silent for like four hours until we wrote the box called governance. And then he stood up like, like Spartacus and decided to then take us down a really long path. And at one point he says, I, I, I don't forget this, he says, you know, I said, what did you think of this exercise? He was awesome. He goes, I thought, he says, you know, in governance, he had a team of like five or six people. He said, I always thought there were only two ways to deliver software at this bank. What I found out in this meeting 
He said, your meeting. I said, this is not your meeting. You should keep doing this. And he said, I, I now I know there's five ways that, are being, that we deliver software, and I didn't know the other three, and now I know why we had all these bypasses that we never could figure out. Imagine that. Um, so this was the last one. This was actually with the investment software team. Again, I, at first I was disappointed they didn't have, they promised me whiteboards um, and maybe smart board, didn't have it, had flip charts, I'm like, this is going to suck. Turns out it was awesome because, like, this was way better because now we had the freedom to just go, you know, this was um, the, the hotel conference room that we used on the fourth day to literally look for the patterns, which were the archetypes. So, A, I ask questions to tease out the archetypes. I get everything on paper in black pen, red pen, blue pen, and then I go ahead and try to pattern match all that back to the archetypes. And so let's go through the archetypes. Um, making work visible. Here's the thing. When I talk to these companies, uh, uh, most of them will have an incredibly high percentage of unknown work. Um, either not captured at all, you know, hey, fr you know, go down to Cube, you know, Bill, can you do this for me? Sure, no problem. Or drive by, or email, or just all sorts of, and I've seen like large organizations, 60% unplanned work, and uh, as high as 40% just completely undocumented. And so I go back to the CIO and, and like, okay, John, what do you think? I'm like, well, you know, if you created, if you were Boeing and you created planes, I would never fly on your plane, right? Um, you, you can't get, if that organization is only capturing, let's just be, say, simply 50% of everything that's going on is undocumented, and you have no idea if there's abuse, if there are things being done the right way or the wrong way, you just don't know. Everything else you do is foolish. Writing automation is silly, because the 50% you're looking at might be the easy and good stuff, and the really terrible stuff is the 50% you're not looking at. So you just might be automation stuff that really doesn't make any difference. Plus there's all sorts of workarounds and hidden work you can't look at bottlenecks. You can't find those Brents. So uh, Domenica Giagrandis has this fabulous book called Making Work Visible. Uh, she calls The Five Thieves of Time. Um, the thing is, this is amazing, but you have to have, like this will not work. And I love Domenica, and this is an amazing book. But if you only have 50% of the data, this is a waste of time. If you have some level of accuracy up in the 90s, this is amazing because now you can classify the work. And now you can see, are there unknown dependencies? I give you a task, but I have no idea that you have to give it to her, him, her, him. Right? I just don't even know that. So I think I gave you a 15-minute task, and now I'm upset because, sorry, I'm picking on you, but then I, and I'm like frustrated because it's taking you three days to do it. I'm like, why is this guy can't do a 15-minute task? But what I don't know is you are dependent on four or five other people, right? So amazing book, but you have to capture the data. So there's a great story in the Phoenix Project. So the Phoenix Project, the book, it's a novel. It's about a project that's three years overdue. The VP of engineering is going to get fired. He meets this guy who's basically kind of a, um, Socrates, if you will, and, and, and helps him to understand why this is the case. It turns out there's a person called Brent, who's a sysadmin, that almost anything that has to happen, the work has to go through him. And so there's a meeting when they're all in the room, and somebody says, I don't understand why when I give you a 30-minute task, it takes like a week to complete, right? That same scenario. And the, the one guy starts explaining a little bit about queuing theory, but in a very watered-down way, because it's a novel, right? But ultimately, you look at Little's Law, um, but, but this is very simple. It says that, here's the thing. If somebody is, and you see um, there's a kind of a knee and a curve at like 80, or what do you call hockey stick. But if you're 90% busy and 10% kind of like um, idle, in general, a very high level overview of, of let's say Little's Law, but I mean really high level, is that every hour of work is going to take nine hours. And so what he says to the, them is, by the way, it looks like, on average, every piece of work that you do here has to go to um, seven other people. 
So therefore, your 30 minute, which will round up to an hour, is actually 63 hours, seven times nine. Right? Like, and so my point is, you have to even be able to have the data to make the, the use like Little's Law or you know, any kind of sophisticated queuing theory. Um, if you haven't read anything by Dine Reimstein, amazing book about flow. Once you have that, then you can actually start. So when I say visible, I don't mean on a screen. I mean visible in that you have the data. Then you can adjust things because now you can find out if there's a whole bunch of unplanned work that really shouldn't have been going to Brent. Brent should have been saying no. Brent's a great guy. He never says no, and he, but he never has time to explain to anybody else how he does things. So you can start teasing that out and start improving the system behavior, the organizational culture structure, right? But you have to have the data. And this is uh, 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 Dominica at a, a workshop we did years ago, me, Jean, her, a bunch of really cool people. It was uh, um, Kanban for DevOps. But once you have that, now you can do things like accurately classify data. You can look at her uh, abstract structure for five thieves of work. You can then do bottleneck analysis. Um, and you can do automation at that point. You are allowed to do automation. In Bacigaloup's realm, you can now do automation, <laughs> right? Imagine that. Somebody telling you you can't do automation, right? Um, the, the second archetype, I may run out of time, but is... So, all right, so first, and here's the thing, they all, it's kind of a pyramid. You get the first one right, the second one fills in the gaps. So for the most part, I put the uh, archetypes in a structure that if you did them sort of in this order, like they all kind of complement. So this is where people have a lot of different, and so if you were to start up, a lot of this is not going to apply, right? But if you're a large Fortune 5000 company or very large institutionalized organization, this is what happens. The last company I was with had 10 ticketing systems. They had, re there was one team using Remini, another team had written their own, another team was using Jira, another team was using SharePoint. I mean, it's just, another team used the, the latest and greatest technology called email, right? Um, like, like, you can't get the first one unless you fix the second one. They, they get tied together. You have to basically get to a place because then you've got, so I'm, I'm, I'm only going to really cover ticketing systems, but you have similar, like if you had 30 pipelines, like everybody's doing a, a kind of a CI CD pipeline differently. Like you, you have another whole form of technical debt and confusion and toilet monitoring. Again, we can talk about over there, um, just bad monitoring systems that send a gazillion emails to everybody and everybody deletes the emails. Um, how many ticketing systems have you have? When I talk to these groups, how do you create tickets? What is the flow of the ticket? Does it actually work? Do you cheat? You know, I had one company that said that, you know, we have one category called minor, it's, it's from ITIL, um, minor no impact. And I asked the room, I said, how many people, because then you don't have to go through their advisory board or approval. And I asked, from that point on, I asked every team, how many people choose minor no impact even though they know it's actually a major impact. Almost everyone, they actually do tell the truth in these meetings. Everybody said yes. And, and it isn't like I'm busting people. And I go back to say, oh, I don't use names. I try to obfuscate the, so they, they can't figure it out like through some reverse, oh, it's that system, it's gotta be Bob. Um, I'd be really careful about, if I get these truths from people, I protect them. But when you tell the CIO that like, hey, by the way, did you know you think the auditor's got all this going on, but almost everybody in your organization is gamifying your system and everything's minor, no impact. I'm like, then like your whole security thing is just charades, it's phony. No accuracy, you can't correlate. I mean, if you have 10 different systems, if you wanted, somebody, if you wanted to hire a full-time coder to correlate all those systems, you'd be wasting your time and it would be incredibly hard and almost useless. Um, this is actually from um, a, a working paper that uh, I work with with a bunch of people. Um, it's out there in IT Revolution. These are countermeasures for those multiple systems. Uh, I'll give you the short story. I typically recommend the middle one, which is sort of a strangler hold pattern. So you don't want to get rid of all those share points and things, but you do want to pick a system that kind of goes down a DevOpsy path, if you will. I apologize for saying a sentence like that, but. Um, but, but here's the thing, and so if you have JIRA, just make it JIRA. 
If you have something alternative, you're fine. But the key point is it has to, you have to switch the whole mentality to a development-based methodology for tickets. So here's the thing. Everything that happens has a ticket. And those tickets then go through a development flow. So they, go, they don't go to a cab or advisory board. They go to the team that, that basically storyboards it, puts it on a thing, does the stand-ups, and has the responsibility for it. And you change, and, and like the infrastructure people, even us, yes, you, operation, yes, you. Everybody becomes a developer-driven, and now you have a resemblance of truth of everything that happens. And I don't know if this will actually translate well, but the Jenga game, you seem to do a bunch of stuff, and you move one thing, and like you win. Well, when you do this, all of a sudden, your um, service catalog for ownership of who owns every application is pretty close to correct, because now you're not getting 50% of all the new services that are added. You're getting 98%. So it's easy then to keep your catalog of this application is owned by Joe. And then all the things like alerting from a, from a monitoring system or um, a, a vulnerability, you get the increased accuracy of the whole bubble of the system starts getting really good. Um, the service pipeline, the only thing I want to say about this is, again, if you're Greenfield, like, go ahead and roll up your sleeves, use your best, like, you know, Travis CI or Circle CI or Jenkins, the shit out of it. Um, but, but if you're a large corporation where you have lots of mainframe and you have this and you have that, and a lot of that stuff, I mean, there's uh, no offense to Google, but I watched Google come into one of my bank customers and they showed him the diagram of these like old um, IBM systems that connect to mainframe COBOL and the Google people were like, where's the source code for that? And like, there's no source code for that. Like, <laughs> there's not even a GUI for that, right? Um, like, you know, th that's the reality of Fortune 5,000 companies. They have 100, you know, they have, not 100, but 40-year-old core service system banking records on some mainframe. I have one customer that runs Kubernetes. Um, they run Kubernetes containers, circuit breaker patterns, chaos monkey on a production banking application, KeyBank. Um, there's videos of him out there. But he connects from those containers to IBM data pipe that connect to COBOL applications. So again, no offense to Google, but when Google came in and said, hey, we, we're going to take care of all this, and they, I'm in the reading and I'm watching, and they're like, where does that line go to? Oh, well, it's, it's called IBM data pipe. What's that? Okay, well, it's a connector. Where does that one go to? It goes to um, an old Sperry system. What? How do you DevOps the shit out of that? Well, you can. So what I'm saying is there are some delivery systems that allow that you to turn over the workflow to the, the engineer, the, to the delivery teams. Um, the third one, um, darn, I thought this was going to be, my timing is always bad. I wrote this presentation last night, by the way. So um, tribal versus institutional knowledge. This typically is the scenario there's a couple of people in the organization that seem to know everything and everybody else is a kind of subordinate to them. Right, they've been there the longest, they know the workarounds, they know like on Wednesdays you gotta bring donuts to Susie to get this done, right? Um, and so the thing is, when I do this, I see this, what I see is I start circling these people. I'm actually gonna add like a green pen or something like that, but and like I start seeing a guy named Lou show up in every meeting. I'm like, okay, that's my Brent, right? And the thing I tell the CIO, which is interesting, I tell him, I walk in, I don't dress up, like, he just met, like, Accenture guy with a tie, an IBM person with a tie, and I come in with sneakers and a shirt like this, and I say, I'm going to tell you stuff that none of those people tell you. Oh, really? I'm like, give me a chance. And then when I come back, I tell them stuff. They don't like hearing it. But they know that when I say, you know, you have uh, basically a bottleneck, and it, it's a guy named Fred, and it's a guy named Lou. And they're like, oh, yeah. I kind of know that. And then you can do, the, in the Phoenix Project, um, there's tons of information about the five focusing stuff. You're basically just now uh, alleviating or subordinating and exploiting the bottleneck. You have to spread that knowledge and stop that bottleneck. And so here's the thing. I can walk into CIO and I can say, you should put Slack. And they'll say, okay, a savvy CIO will say, okay, John, yes, I'll do this. They'll say, why? And then... A general DevOps consultant would say, well, because everybody uses it and you have to do it and it's awesome. 
And a really good sale is like, yeah, so? Tell me why. And then the conversation dies. So I go in after targeting all these people and say, you need to use Slack. And they go, why? I'm going to because you have these four bottlenecks, Fred, Lou, Susie, and Jane. And like the only way you're going to start decoupling that or institutionalize their knowledge, first step is use Slack because it is awesome, as far as I can tell. Um, and, and then your wikis are all bullshit because nobody knows how to get to them. But if, you, if the engineering team creates an internal and an external, and everybody knows they can go to the external engineering team or the infrastructure team, and they can ask questions, maybe Lou or Fred get a little more time to link to the wiki page that's been there. And then somebody comes back in Slack and says, hey, that was wrong. Step five doesn't work. And maybe Lou or Fred take a little extra time to fix the wiki. The Jenga effect. Right? So here's the, that's the key here. The low tech gives me the privilege to recommend the high tech. Because if I just recommend the high tech and they don't understand why, it typically doesn't turn out well. Because then I can do chat ops and chat bots and one of our customers are using Azure um, ML, which is really cheap and really easy for very simple, which we've already, we got up to like 30% of this thing self-learning answering questions. And the people who wrote it were operators. They had no data science. It, like, that, like um, I don't know if the other tools are as easy as this. I'm a big fan of TensorFlow for other reasons from Google. But, but for this, I mean, the fact that these just operations infrastructure people had no data science, weren't even math people, didn't know statistics or anything, were able to create something that's up to 30% accuracy in self-answering questions on Slack. And the cost is like, like zero. Um, the fourth one, um, it's silos. Like, you have to bust silos. I mean, most people know this. Um, silos create villains. You know, if infrastructure's on the third floor, software engineering's on the fifth floor, and cyber's on the sixth floor, and they never meet, except maybe occasionally in the elevator, it's real easy to create villainy. The cyber people, they're two floors above. I'm pretty safe, right? Um, but when you put them in a room together, like, the villains disappear, and, like, I force them to disappear. Of course, when Sue says, um, this never works, and then I get Jane, who wrote the interface, I say, hey, uh, Jane, Sue says that never works, because I love killing. I'm going to write a whole thing about platitudes and how to, like, kill platitudes. Um, never. This is a nightmare, right? Like, you, you, those are beauty things to deconstruct. There's nothing's a nightmare, and like there's nothing that never works, right? Unless it really never works, but then, <laughs> but and then I say, I say, Jane, um, Sue says it does it never works, and she's like, that's impossible. And then she asks Sue, like, what do you mean? She says, well, it seems like when I do this, 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 and get to here, and I select that, oh well, you're doing it wrong. And then it turns out no worse, you do wrong. Like, okay, well, Jane, is there a better way to get Sue? You know, you, you see, right? But we stop from just we're done. It never works. Those people suck. Um, and so how do you fix that? You, I mean, graphical storytelling. They're, I was at a bank in Australia. They would say, can you consult? I'm like, hell no. I got two kids, a wife. I cannot come over here like every other week. And I said, the best give I can give you is this graphical storytelling. Learn it, use it. It will work really well. But Lean Coffee, if you haven't heard about Lean Coffee, we'll can talk about it over there. It's a great way in a large institutional place to get people to come to learn about all the things. It's a cheap, just like every Wednesday, um, in, internal DevOps days, hackathons, and then uh, again, DevOps Dojo, I can talk about. Um, um, the, the, um, the two last ones I want to get through is, is the structure of the organization. I'm going to go through this pretty quick. Um, how are you organized? Um, the problem is, again, siloed teams, um, redundancy. Um, there's this notion of what they call I-shape, T-shape, and E-shape. The people, have anybody heard of this? Um, anyway, uh, an I-shape, one person, two people. I-shape is somebody who's very specific, usually find in silos. I know this. Do not ask me anything else but this. T-shape is, I know this really well, but I'm pretty good at these things. Where we try, in fact, I, I'm, I'm sad that I can't be in the SRE, Pop, because they assigned me to the DevSecOps one, but because I would love to be in that one. But SRE seems to be more like an E shape, or they even call it a comb shape, 
where now you have lots of skills. And so, um, to, you know, skip to the punchline, Conway's Law, uh, I'm going to skip this, but I'll just say that, you know, Melvin Conway, if you're siloed, his, his famous thing was, I think it's like if you have three teams building a compiler, you're going to have a three-pass compiler, right? Uh, it's a simplified version of his law, but the thing is, is that if you're a siloed organization, your code and how you, even how you do Kubernetes and circuit breaker patterns and Istio and Envoy, and even if you're into like API extensibility and API machinery, which is all the, all the shit that the cool kids are doing now, like it will be siloed and it will adhere to Conway's law. <laughs> uh, so take that, all you geeky young folks. Um, so the answer is, um, there's lots of ways to describe it. We used in the handbook something called um, the, the Organizational Archetypes by Fernando Fernandez. There's a lot of ways you can look at this. Functional is siloed. It's very command and control. The boss, the boss is the person who works for the boss, is your boss. Uh, matrix is the worst. It's the dotted line. Uh, again, I could talk about that. It's terrible. Um, what you find in most startups and what large organizations are trying to transform to is what they call market organization. We talk about this in the book, but the blue there, optimized for responding quickly to customers. So you build, some people call it a flat organization. Um, there's lots of ways to kind of skin this cat, if you will, if that translates. This is my favorite. Um, a lot of different terms. It's called bill run teams. Um, Amazon called this two pizza teams. Um, this is like, again, there's lots of ways to do things. Whatever works, works. Um, I like this because you start building around the service those originally kind of I-shaped individuals all in one circle for the service. Over time, they start looking more T-shaped. If you're really good, they become E-shaped. And here's the kicker, right? So then the first thing the CIO says, John, I can't do that. It's redundancy. Why would I have a tester in one system? Another system? Why wouldn't I have just one test team? I'm like, yeah, why well, I ought to? But here's the thing is, what I tell them is, Imagine the price you pay up front for this redundancy, the benefit is over some period of time, you have a fully E-shaped organization. Because what happens is every one of those little silos, the tester learns about network and architecture and design. And so now all of a sudden after some period of time, everybody in the organization is fully competent about everything in the organization. And, like, and so the debt you paid up front comes back, and, and again, go read anything, uh, well, read Toyota Kata by Mike Rotha if you want to see how it was done in manufacturing. Um, last but not least, with seven minutes, okay, I was supposed to have 10, but here we go. Um, the original presentation, which I shortened down, it is an archetype, uh, security and compliance, what I call theater. It means you're doing a whole bunch of stuff that are making all your software delivery teams really, really upset. And I love saying this, what you're doing doesn't pass the smell test. Like, they're not stupid. When they know that, like, they put minor no impact for everything they do, and they've been doing it for three years, and nobody's called them on it, then they know your whole system of compliance is bullshit. Um, you know, and so, like, they know. Like, you think you're putting some, and the, the, for those who are not familiar with the, the change advisory board, like every Wednesday, you have to submit something, and there's a group of people who are supposedly, they're lower paid people, by the way, who are supposedly knowledgeable about the whole complex system. And if you haven't paid attention in the last five years, our systems are incredibly complex. <laughs> like, ridiculously complex systems. So we, we have these, like, lower paid five or six people whose responsibility is either to reject or accept a change that they haven't written, they don't know about. Like, it's, it's ridiculous. And so what I have to do is bust that apart for first, you're not really protect, they're not protecting the system. And that's why that kind of build run works really well because you flip the cab to the team and the team makes those decisions. And by the way, the team is the one who's going to get caught. Somebody told me a quote that like, I was so upset that he said, I love when a leadership or a manager tells me how long it, takes, it should take to write something when they have never written any code. You know, so the, the review boards, I look for the structure. I had one company, um, seven review boards that every change they had to go through. Had to go to an architecture review board, a, a product review board, a cab. 
Um, there was even a, a mandatory wait period just to be safe. And if somebody said, nobody's ever rejected any of my changes in 10 years in that mandatory wait. So like, hey, last thing, let's just wait four hours. Why? I don't know, but like, I think it feels really safe to wait four hours. Why? Um, and here's the other thing which is interesting too, because I don't just, I, 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 I run a thin line where I, well, I'm really close to people who might really dislike me when I do these things. Especially when I put teams together and I say, Bill, didn't you tell me last week that when this happens and this happens, because Sue is telling me it doesn't work that way. Tell me the truth. But I do the same thing to the leaders. They don't know that when we get to the end of the summary, I ask them questions about the auditors. And then I say, how do you react to the auditors? And like, well, we don't tell them things they don't really, if they don't know something, we don't tell them. I'm like, you are just as bad as, you know, not bad, but like your organizational culture. Imagine that. The auditors are supposed to be the ones that protect you. We just wrote a paper out of the DevOps forum called Dear Auditor, where we apologize. It's a tongue in cheek. It's out there in IT Rev. You should read it. Where, as an industry, we apologize to our auditors for being such assholes. Right? Like, you have to get the auditors to come in. Um, let them know about things like Chef and Puppet and Ansible. Um, let them know that, like, you can build immutable binary containers that once they leave the, um, the development environment, um, if they pass all the tests, they never change. Let them know that you actually build pipeline as code and explain what that is. In fact, when you're building pipeline as code, like, so f uh, building ephemeral just-in-time pipelines, right? Uh, like, and it's all built from infrastructure code. So when I do my um, kind of commit, um, basically the automated pipeline gets generated from infrastructure's code stuff that time and goes away when it's done. So you tell the auditor, by the way, this is really cool. I have a read-only immutable binary in a container. It passes all the vulnerability smoke tests. Um, and then from that point on, not only does no human touch it, so separation of duties or all those things that are compliances in the US, um, nobody touches it from all the way into production. But not only that, nobody even touches the actual system that builds the pipeline. Because that's built dynamically too. And then you can basically, I've had customers then use, um, like uh, using Vault, I know there's a presentation on Vault, right? They'll actually send little um, um, kind of audit trail, I, I want to say blockchain, but it's not that sophisticated, but like a blockchain of basically these crypto events, so they can't be min and metal, that the auditors, you can explain to them, say, you don't have to look at code, I don't have to show you chef recipes, I don't have to show you Docker. <laughs> like, I can just show you, and I, again, I'll use the embarrassing word blockchain, because there's no better way to describe it. It, ain't block, it doesn't have to be blockchain. But you show them the blockchain of what happened with the kind of tag or SHA or JIRA ticket that's in production. What, who built, and what did this? Ah, brilliant. Let me show you the blockchain of where it started and where it came from. I'm working with Capital One. We're doing this right now. Um, you know, the, I have a whole presentation on how, like, exploitable open source is. I mean, if you, if you look here, um, over 10 years of growth, um, the 2018 report from, uh, from Sonatype is the Maven Central, 87 billion downloads now. Um, like, the, the cost of breaches is off the chart. One million records cost $40 million from the IBM report. 50 million records is about 350 million cost breach. And that doesn't include opportunity loss costs. Um, I'm gonna split this, you know, DevSecOps. So, uh, all right, finish here in one minute. So what DevSecOps is, quite simply. Um, first off, I will say, if you wanna argue about the name, please go to that side of the room. If you wanna talk about how to make things better and like, I don't give a shit what the name is, because I didn't create it, Shannon Leitz does, um, then f meet me over here. But what it means is, like, doing what we've done very well with DevOps, but add security on top of the pipeline. So those gates that we put in as we're building the pipeline, green, green, red, go back, fix, green, 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 red, go back, fix, we just start overlaying the, um, the pipeline. And here's the thing, right? So in DevOps, we've got this down, and these are just icons. I, you know, I, I actually do like these products, but they're not recommendations. There are other products. Um, the point is that we typically, and we think about DevOps, 
we think about filling in all the boxes, having automation kind of at every stage. Um, we can shift left and move things left as we find them. This all comes from the manufacturing paradigm. Um, in security, we just need to do the same thing. Right? And I have a whole presentation. We'll talk about this at length, actually, um, in the BOF, if you're interested. So I will go through this, and we can talk about this. But I kind of want to end with this, and then I'm done with 15 seconds. So my operational tips for DevOps is educate your auditors. Like, bring them into the fold. Ask them to help you build your systems, because now they have skin in the game. It, it, you know, it's a collaboration, right? It's a breakdown of walls. Um, ruthlessly ruthlessly eliminate false positives on vulnerabilities. I will tell you that if you think, you, if you're going out and trying to buy the most expensive uh, vulnerability scanning or artifact scanning tool, um, and you don't know what your signal noise ratio is from that tool, because it's a hard problem, you're going to create an incredibly bad anti pattern with your service delivery and developers. Because they're going to get overloaded with events, and they're going to delete all events. And by the way, if you've heard about Equifax, that's a high level of kind of what happened. They got a severity 10, which is the worst fire in the fire station, and it seemingly was ignored. Um, so, like, really work on that. Um, and we can talk more about that. Um, um, and explain vulnerabilities in business impact terms. Like, don't just say, here's the vulnerability, it's CV 00188, then go to uh, OWASP to figure out what it is. Like, create your own version of, like, by the way, this is the vulnerability that took Equifax down. Or uh, Shannon leads it into it, she actually simulates the breach. So she says, oh, by the way, that last change, here's the um, simulated dump of, you know, 15 million records of loan applications. Uh, I, I prefer that you fix this in 15 minutes. Um, DevOps, the vulnerability. Um, I, I should be done like just a couple of, uh, I apologize for going probably two and a half minutes over. Um, the, uh, the, what I mean by that is a bug is a bug is a bug. Like do not treat security vulnerabilities in a different backlog, a different ticketing system, but then like in the stand-up, like normalize the fact that it isn't really security, that it's just vulnerable or possibly bad software. So Jira it, backlog it, Kanban it, do it in the stand-up. Do not let your developers get out of the realm of that's something they do. No, no, it's what we do. Um, finally, um, you know, educate, you know, open the code base. I, I don't understand why companies do this. And then just educate. Like some companies will put all the code examples of the top 10 OWASPs in their own GitHub repository. And when they find new vulnerabilities, they give the example. So when they send the message, they say, this is the one that took down um, Equifax, and by the way, you can simply reorder the includes of the modules in a different way, and it doesn't matter, or here's the code that you should use. Um, anyway, that's it. I'm out of here.